to be our 39th lesson in the book of Ephesians. And the Lord willing, we'll conclude this third chapter tonight. Now, Paul is continuing to expound the great salvation <laughs> in which men, by God's grace, participate. <coughs> And this epistle, from time to time, after this, he will mention things that uh, men are responsible for doing, circumstances that are expected to exist among God's people. I say they're expected to exist. If they don't, then God's people have to drop everything and see to it they do. Amen. When God tells a church to do something, the church has got to take it seriously. I'm afraid in our day it hasn't. We have been faced with an inordinate number of church leaders that have not apprised the people of what God expects. Mm -hmm. To say nothing of what he's done. <coughs> so what Paul is doing here, he's telling us what God's done, what salvation's all about, and a lot of people don't know what it's all about. But they can. <clears throat> all of this teaching, so all three of these chapters, we haven't even got in to be what, what people are expected to do yet. We haven't even touched on that yet. Not a, not a syllable. He first of all, in the first chapter, told us what God did. Second and third chapters, he's telling us why he did it. And I know it may sound a little hard to say this, but it isn't because he thought so much of you. In fact, if you were the only ones involved, or we were the only ones involved, this probably would never have happened. He's told us in his third chapter that God's teaching principalities and powers in heavenly places about how wise he is and the way he's working with the church. So you take that out of the scenario, and there's really not a lot of reason for us to be here. Amen. That shouldn't discourage anybody. That should, that's quite a privilege, <laughs> actually. Quite a privilege. Now, he's going to, after this, lay out a few responsibilities in chapters 4 through 6. They're going to be pretty weighty, but he's building up to this, see? <laughs> this is the banner. This is the divine manner. First of all, the Lord impresses you with himself. <laughs> That's number one. Because nobody is as sensitive of God as they ought to be. Too many people live unconscious of God. Oh, there's a lot of talk and yap about it, but the truth of the matter is they're not, they really don't think much about it. So the first thing he does, he impresses them with himself. Now, when, when he gave the law, he tests, he showed them by, by a physical demonstration that like to scare everybody to death. That's what he told them about himself. Don't fool around with me. That's what he was saying. Oh, that's what he was saying. You would say, I don't like the sound of that. Well, you be, better be thanked that God is like that and didn't just come on you all of a sudden. So he first of all, he impressed him with who he was. Well, just very limited revelation. It wasn't, it was very limited. Just pictured as his feet touching a mountain. <laughs> he didn't even come and sit down in a mountain. Just his feet just touched it. Mountain like to fill apart the whole... Sinaitic Peninsula shaking and quaking, the mountains on fire, dreadful smoke all around, a tempest, there's like a hurricanes are blowing all the time, and a voice so loud it break your eardrums, and it kept getting louder and louder, and after that's all over, then he told them what he wanted to say. Now, he could do that all the time, but that isn't his preference. Now, it's not generally known that a lot's expected of the saved. This, just did, this is not common knowledge. And it wasn't in the first century either. That's why Paul's spending time on this. 
if he's going to show principalities and powers who are way up above us, I mean, there's no comparison between us and these principalities and powers. Must be comical for them to look at us as lowly, weakly, temporal creatures, so obtuse and so dense by heaven's standards. Well, the most brilliant people on earth are on an idiot level next to the, these people, these personalities in heavenly places. Now, to teach them about God's wisdom in a people, there's got to be some kind of product there that takes divine wisdom to produce. That's what he's telling them about here in this chapter. See, the general perception of salvation is it has to do with forgiveness of sins and God taking care of you in this. That's about it. But that's not about it. That's all preparatory. That's all preparatory. Things like, remember he's teaching principalities and powers. Third chapter, verse 10. Teaching principalities and powers, his multifaceted wisdom. You can't get God in a corner where he doesn't know what to do. Yeah, you, get, you, you can get in a position like, like that. And even the devil can get in a position like that. And even holy angels have to have help once in a while, like that angel that flew down to Daniel. See, he's going to show them the church things that aren't common in our day, but they're intended to be common, like unity of the spirit mm -hmm. yeah. and the bond of peace. Mm -hmm. Like everybody speaking the same thing and thinking the same way. Uh -huh. You've probably never seen a handful of people like this. Actually, in my 76 plus years, I've only known relatively few groups that exceeded that were two that they were in perfect agreement. I and my father were that way. Really, I haven't known like two to say nothing of a body. That's what salvation's all about. And he's teaching these hosts about them. Now, the truth of the matter is, as Jesus prayed, I'm going to affirm that a large part of evangelism and missionary work is total vanity. A waste of time. I'm going to tell you why I said this. Jesus said, when he prayed to the Father, that they all might be one as we are one, Jesus and God are one, that they might be one in us, thou in me, I in them, they and us, that, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Amen. Do you really think that's going to happen with a divided church? Well, it is not. Amen. It's not going to happen. God won't let it happen. God won't let a church that is not united with him and the Father, be successful in any kind of legitimate outreach. It will not happen. For it to happen contradicts what he's doing. That's why Paul is teaching. He's going to make a big issue of this in the fourth chapter about this unity. He's going to make a big issue out of this. So I want to say that by way of introduction. Everything that God does for the church is for everybody in the church. Amen. There isn't any keen insights that are just for, you know, select few people. They're for them all. But this is a hard thing to see. Because in the church world, there's nothing like this. This doesn't exist on any significant scale. Not on a town scale, city scale, state scale, continent scale, global. This doesn't exist, and everybody knows it doesn't exist. That's why most people do this when you talk about the things of God. That's why. You say, well, it's because they don't have an interest. Well, why do you think they don't? 
They probably can't rationalize it. I understand that, but that's why God doesn't work in that kind of environment. Uh -huh. All right, now it's continuing on now, opening up what God's doing, verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3. He, had, he just, he couldn't go any longer. He just had to break out in praise. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let it, let it stand just like that. I like it. <laughs> Now, some words that look like they're incidental here that we, we want to spend a little bit of time on. Now, <laughs> see, when it comes to the things of God, now is an important word. Some people think about then, maybe soon, around the corner, sometime. Now, that's an important word, now. Now, this is an interesting word, now. It's translated from a word that means joined to terms with a certain emphasis, and such additions as tend to explain and establish them more exactly. So it's not now, it just isn't like time. <laughs> it's, now you've heard what I've said and laid this foundation. Now I'm going to I'm going to reason a little further with all that in mind. This is why no one should preach scatterbrained sermons. I've heard my share of them. I don't want to hear any more scatterbrained sermons that really don't say they're just, just a bunch of yapping. That's all it is. I like to from one standpoint, I didn't like from another standpoint. <laughs> An observation that Brother Curram said about preaching that he'd heard. He said, first they tell a story. Then they tell another story. And then they tell another story. I said, Brother, that's amazing. You caught on to that. That's not, now is not this type of thing. Yeah. Now says, I brought you up to this point now, and now we're getting ready to think. We're going to go a little deeper now. We're not going to piddle around here on the top. Now, it's a form of reasoning. Now, the statement he's reasoning on is this, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> Well, I mean, like, how much of God are you satisfied with? Yeah. Huh? That you, or ye is plural, might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's, now, that's the thing we're going to go on from. We're going to reason on it from that. <laughs> Being filled with the fullness of God does not refer to something we do. It refers to something that God does in us. Amen. But it's conditional. He's told you before this can happen, I'm praying about this. I preached about praying about it. That God would strengthen you with might by his spirit in the inner man. That way Christ can, can dwell in your heart by faith. And if Christ dwells in your heart by faith, you'll be rooted and grounded in love. And if you're rooted and grounded in love, you'll be able to comprehend with all saints what is the height and length and depth and breadth and know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge. And when you get to there, then you can be filled with all the fullness of God. So if a person is not full of God, now you know why. Perhaps they're not strengthened. Christ really isn't dwelling in them. 
Just what he said. You might be strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man that, in order that, Christ can dwell in your heart by faith. So receiving Christ really isn't the final point. It's Jesus staying when he comes. Amen. And you got to be strong for that to happen. Not sentimental. Strong. Mm -hmm. Then when Christ comes, of course, he goes to work. Yeah. Yeah. Then you're rooted and grounded in love. That's his love. Yeah. That's the soil you're anchored in. Once you see his love because he loved you, you love him too. We love him because he first loved us. You see it. You're rooted and grounded. <coughs> and now you're able to understand some things. Now you don't scratch your head when you read the Bible. You're able to make sense out of it. Because you, why? Because you can see God in it. That's why. And then now you're a candidate to be filled with all the fullness of God. Now that that's all happened. <laughs> now, <coughs> of course, we are, I get to ask the question, has that happened to you? Uh -huh. This isn't for me to determine whether it has or not, but you best be determining it. If this is happening, like, where are you? Where, where are you in that process? He, he listed a process. Yeah. He revealed a process. Yeah. Strengthened with might, Christ dwells in your heart by faith, rooted and grounded in love, able to comprehend with all saints. Like, where where do you see yourself in that? You say, well, I don't know. Ben, take this thing up with God and don't do anything else till you get this resolved, till you know where you're at. Some people are way down here at the beginning part of the scale wondering why they're not going very far. This stuff has got to happen. Mm -hmm. And if you're not filled with the fullness of God, do you really think you're going to live with him forever? Do you think God's going to ha take up habitation with someone that's unlike himself? Yeah. Well, of course you're not. And the only way, you can't be like God by emulation. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a partaker of the divine nature. That's the way you become like God. So this is what he's, what he's talking about. <coughs> Now, unto, now that's an important word too. Unto. He's pointing our minds heavenward. If you're going to get something from God, you've you got to be looking that way. Unto, I thought, how do you, it's an important word, unto. It's used 37 times in this book, unto. And it's used 500 and 45 times in the epistles, unto. Now here's kind of a clumsy effort to explain what it means. Truth is like a maze. It's all makes, if, you, if you're looking at the maze of up here, I mean, you can, you can see. You ought to go here, you ought to go there. You can see it when you get a pine. If a maze isn't a mystery at all, we're on the ground level at that's something else. It's like a maze, and unto is like a sign. This says this, turn here. And you get out there, here's another, now here's another unto sign, turn here. That's what unto is like. It's, it's shifting your focus as you go along so you can see the pathway clearer. Unto is more important than context. Some people worship the context. They, they say, well, it all depends what the context is. But see, the context is largely determined by interpretation. That's, now, that's a snag. Wherever interpretation enters in, you've got a vulnerable point here. So unto is infinitely more power than context. If you know where God's going with the truth, you'll see it sooner than if you are an expert in, quote, the context. And then, then there's different kind of context. There's the verse context. There's the context of the epistle. There's the context of the church at large. And there's the context of God's eternal purpose, which says the ultimate context. But see, you can't depend on that to get you through the maze. It's, you've got, it's, you, step by step, you've got to know where you're going, and that's this un, unto. Yes. No, ain't God. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unto. Now. 
Now you see these things. Unto, let's point heavenward. Him. That's the God you're going to be filled with his fullness. Now Paul will not have us consider salvation without deity being at the center of it. <laughs> see, some people, when they talk about salvation, well, I come from this background. When they talk about salvation, they talk about the plan of salvation, which really doesn't have a whole lot to do with God. It has to do with what you do. And that's pretty much what they think about. But God is the, God is the point in salvation. You've got to get your eyes fixed on God. Now just in this book of Ephesians alone, the word God is mentioned 33 times. The word Father is mentioned 8 times. The word Lord is mentioned 48 times. The word Spirit is mentioned 12 times. Just in this 6th chapter epistle. This epistle has 3,022 words and 226 sentences. That means 3.5% of all the words are deity. And 84% 84 of the sentences mention God. Now you tell me, what's the emphasis of Ephesians? Let's take all the pronouns that apply to the Ephesians. There's 50 as compared to 192. I mean, as you do the math, <laughs> you come up with he. That's, that's the center. He doesn't say, you're able, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. See, that's how the world talks. Yeah, yeah. That's, not how, that's not how inspired people talk. He is able, he is able. So when you talk about ability, don't talk about us. Amen. Talk about God who gives you ability. Uh -huh. Now what about this God? Now, to God... What are we going to say about God? Well, he can do exceedingly abundantly. Exceeding abundantly. That means it's out of reach. I mean, it goes, it, it's like space. You get to talking about God's ability and it's like your space. You invent a theological telescope. You can see further and you find out, whoa, it says more, there's more out there. That's the way it is with God. He is able to do exceeding abundantly. Well, what, what do you, what do you feel are the main things that you ask God to do, in view of the fact He's able to do exceeding abundantly? Like what, what would you ask Him to do? Would you go to Paul Anderson, who used to be the world's strongest man when I was a boy, lifted a thousand nineteen pounds over his head, say, "Could you carry this bag of candy for me?" Oh, a lot of prayer is a bag of candy prayer. I'm telling you the truth here, brother. Sometimes, see, there is not a consciousness of what God is able to do. Why would you diddle around in the wading pool when you can launch out into the deep with God? Amen. Able to exceeding abundantly. That's a category. That's a category. Exceeding abundantly. Nothing that man does fits into that category. This is an exclusive category belonging to God. It's outside the border of human aptitude, intelligence, ability, whatever. And it certainly doesn't have anything to do with casualness and half-heartedness. I mean, if a person is not pressing toward the marks, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, fighting the good fight of faith, resisting the devil, going on to perfection, putting to death the deeds of the body, perfecting holiness of the fear of the Lord, unless he's doing this, this doesn't mean anything. It's just religious philosophy. That's all it is. But if you are engaged in those things, it's a piece of good news. To hear about someone who's able to do exceeding, that means it keeps on abundantly, there's a lot of it. See, in the world, the more valuable a thing is, the less there is of it. 
You don't have mountains of diamonds, at least not stored away. This isn't, this isn't how the world operates. And in the world, as you use it, it diminishes. So in economics, we talk about the scarce allocation of economic resources because they become depleted. But is is exceeding. See, things of earth go down. What God does goes up. <laughs> what you use in the earth gets less, less, less. What God does gets more, more, more. Now, exceeding abundantly above some things we want. Now, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask, or a thing maybe we're afraid to ask, yet we think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, man can't even think big enough yeah. to engage a God that can do a seating abundantly above all. We ask or think. When it comes to our focus and the things where we are to devote our attention, we are directed by revelation, not imagination. Now, Satan will tempt you to think about it. So what could I do? What could I do? I want to do something. What? What could I do? And you'll think small. Yes. Ask small things because they are under the impression that this is exhibiting humility <laughs> yes, toward God. True. I don't want a lot, Lord, you know, that sort of thing. But humility is not is not really an expression of of a smallness as it is submission to the will of God rather than seeking yeah. to satisfy our own desires uh -huh. apart Amen. from God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I was also considering this, that something that's differing from this kingdom principle in the world is that when something is so large you can't see the bounds, so people are less inclined to search it out. Because yeah. they know they can't attain the whole. They can't reach yeah. the limits. Mm -hmm. But in, in the Lord, yeah. the revelation that you mentioned is what actually spurs his people on to right. know mm -hmm. what is unattainable. That's right. That's right. See, here there's something thrown into the mix here that the world doesn't know about. Jesus is bringing us to God, so we're not doing this. We're not like go to the resources and get what we need and move on. Jesus is bringing us to God. The Holy Spirit is strengthening us within. So you see, you've got a lot of things that make this accessible. Yes, With the intercessor above and one inside, mm -hmm. this now suddenly changes. Yes. What God can do in you Amen. changes Amen. changes it dramatically. Now, if you take away the, the declaration or proclamation of the promises of That's God, right. then men have no expectations. That's right. Of God. That's right. And what makes it so exciting is that we see the same things, and we're encouraged by that with by having the same understanding. Yes. That's encouraging. Amen. Amen. I've been Amen. there. Now you're there. Let's continue on. Amen. Yeah. It was a. Uh, a great liberty, I can remember as, when I experienced it as I was in my late teens. When it burst on me, what I had access to in Christ. Just, I mean, it was in the Bible. I could have quoted you a verse, hundreds of verses that said it. But it suddenly burst on my spirit. It changed what I aimed to do. Changed how I petitioned God. Changed how I look for opportunities. It redefined open doors. It, it changed everything. That's what Paul's doing here. He's given them the kind of perspective that will change all of life. How they look at it. Whether you're young or whether you're old, there'll come a time when you'll think to yourself, I just can't do it. Whatever it is, I just, it's over my head. I can't grasp it. You, if that hasn't happened to you, well, it's, it will. It'll happen to you sometime. But if you have this perspective, you can keep moving. It doesn't make any difference what it is. If it's your job, it doesn't make any difference what it is. He's able to exceeding abundantly above all we ask to think. Then he says... <laughs> 
according to. You notice how all this now is linked together. These unto's and according to's and in order that, they, they all are linking mm -hmm. the thought together. According to the power that worketh in us. So he, he identifies the power. What power is it? A power that's resident in heaven? Only in God? And well, he says, no, 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 we're talking about God. There is power that God has that's not available to you. Now, there, there is. It's transcendent to what he's doing in salvation right now. There is that total, sort of power. God's abilities doesn't top out in salvation. Yeah, yeah, that's, right. that's, that's one of the enterprises that he's working on. It's the primary one right now. According to <coughs> another one of those reasoning expressions. Mm -hmm. You can say, keep this thought. Now I'm going to further define it. Unto points us forward. <coughs> and the other word we used, unto, in the first you pointed us backwards. So you've got to, in other words, he's saying, keep that thought I just gave you there, that he is going to implement you being filled with all, the body of Christ, being filled with all the fullness of God. He's going to implement that by divine power. And his tap is to be the power that's in us. <clears throat> The engine driving everything pertaining to salvation is found in divine power. Amen. And if you have Jesus, you've got the power. 1 Corinthians one twenty four says of Jesus, defines him in Christ, who is the power of God. That's 1 Corinthians one twenty four. The power... Power that works, uh, not that dwells, works. If this power is not allowed to work, it'll leave. That's the way it works. In fact, if Jesus isn't received properly, he'll leave too. He dwells in your heart by faith, so you're, the presence of Christ is only as strong as your faith. But if you have a strong faith, you've got a big presence. Little faith, he's close to the door. <laughs> in the Laodicea, he was plumb outside the door. He was outside the church in Laodicea. Power that worketh in us. Different versions read this way. The power that is at work within us. So it's contemporary. By the power, there isn't any other power, whose power is at work in us. God uses the power that is working in us according to the power that is working among us. All right, now there's, the, there's the body part. The power operating in us that is, is, per, is performing, is doing something specific. It's not just making a show. And by the consequence of the action of his power that is at work with us. So this thing that he brought up about being filled with all the fullness of God, that's what he's been that's what he's commenting on. This thing is going to come to pass by the power that is working in us. And it would also be proper to say among us. As a matter of fact the pronoun is a plural pronoun. The body of Christ is never considered independently of the members, and the members are never considered in isolation of the body. Mm -hmm. yeah, see. Yeah. About the time says, I, don't, I can do without everybody. No, you can't. Amen. No, you can't. Any more than your toe can do without your foot. Can't do it at all. According to the power that now works in, so what kind of power is this? Well, it can't be defined lexically and by dictionaries because there's words in scripture that are outside the parameter of human wisdom and experience there just as anything like it. there isn't anything like it in the world 
Here's the lexical definition of power. Dunamis. Not dunamis dynamite. I don't know who first thought of that, but we need to find out who it was and, and forbid to him to speak anymore. Is dunamis as in dynamo that produces something? Here's the lexical definition of that word dunamis. Strength, power, ability, inherent power, power residing in a thing or virtue of its nature, or which a person or thing exists and puts forth its power for performing miracles. Well, that didn't do a whole lot for me. I, but I understand why. I, it isn't, it's not the fault of the lexicographer. It's not their fault. It's that we're, they, this is out of, their, <laughs> out of their domain. See, there's some words used in the Bible. There is no other, there is no language that conveys that word. That's why you had to have transliteration. That's why that existed. There wasn't any parallel word. And this is, this is one of them here. This is productive power. It's power that does something, that accomplishes something. It's not something that just is a display, like a strong man lifting a big rock. It isn't, it isn't like that. It's productive power. And actually, in the world, power is not associated with productivity. Like if you use dynamite, it blows things apart. But God's power brings things together. See, it's a different kind of a different kind of a power. You wouldn't, you'd say that a man would use wisdom to build a skyscraper. That didn't necessarily take power. But what God's doing takes this kind of power that is he has no limitation on what he can do of himself. He has the ability to complete everything he starts and to give everything he's promised. That's the kind of power now we're talking about, according to the power that works in us. It's not a power unrelated to God. It's related to God. It's God's power. It's not our power. It works in us, but it's not ours. Now, normally, what you have working for you is yours. But this isn't the case with this power. It works in us, but it doesn't belong to us. It's, so to speak, on loan. And as if we handle it well, then wait till you see what we get in the end. This is an objective that can't be accomplished by human ingenuity or will or ability. What God, this is something that has to be done. You, the people of God have to end up filled with all the fullness of God. That's, that's where we're going. This has got to happen. This is not an option. Yeah, See, the world has set us up with a little bit of religion, a little bit of faith, a little bit of interest. At least they come now and then and send their tithes in, you know. And, but that won't, that won't make it in the kingdom of God. That's, why? Because that's not what God's doing. Amen. Filled with all the fullness of God. So this is a piece of good news about this exceeding great power yeah. and now to learn it's working in us this this is intriguing it's not a power that must be appropriated by the saints they, if they got Christ they got it already Amen. now how's that for a piece of good news <laughs> I mean, when was the last time you like took inventory what you have in Christ it's good to take a little inventory. You know what, what God says is there, and then you can, if you're wise, you'll be able to see indicate, oh yeah, yeah, I got that, I got that because I've been doing, I've been advancing in this area, so I, I've got that. Mm -hmm. Take a little inventory of what you have. So you can see what Paul's doing here. He's gonna lay some heavy obligations on the people now. When they do it with this in mind, the exceeding greatness of the power that's right now at work in us, work in us well, that it means it's doable. They take inventory so they can pay tax on everything they have. <laughs> yeah. we, we take inventory so God can bless us <laughs> for everything he's given us. <laughs> now, I want to go over again now what's the, 
the requirements for this to work <coughs> is that you had to be strengthened with all might by his spirit in the inner man in order that Christ can dwell in your heart by faith so you can be rooted and grounded in love so you can comprehend the height and length and depth with and know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge so you can be filled with all the fullness of God. See, there's all these things <laughs> got to be preceded. And if you've got, if you're along the, if you you see yourself somewhere in the process there, that's your proof that the power is working in you. If the power wasn't working in you, you'd not got past number one back there. If you were strengthened in might, with might by the Spirit in the inner man, so Christ is dwelling and you're having this fellowship with Christ that you've been called into, as 1 Peter 1 9 says, and you have this fellowship, see, the power is what did that. Yeah. And the same power that did that is going to fill you with all the fullness of God before this project is over. Yeah. Yes? I got a thought here, and it might need more clarification, but I was thinking about how Christ was given a body to contain sin. And now his body is to contain the fullness of God. Yeah. And um, so that that goes in with the purpose of God. We think why it, it oh, yeah. came to take away sin because we he this was why it came to take it away too. So Amen. that the body could contain the fullness Amen. of God. And okay. both of those, sin in Jesus and fullness in us, are both impossible without God. <laughs> yeah, it would never have happened if Christ would have yeah. never came and to he, he, did. he became poor. Yeah. that we might yeah. become rich. Yeah. Not with silver and gold, because Jesus never did have silver and gold, as far as we know. Peter had come right out and told you, I don't have any money. Yeah. What he said to that <laughs> man at the temple, so I knew what church he didn't belong to when he said that. <laughs> now, if, if it wasn't this way, that all of these things strengthened with all might by the Spirit and the inner man, Christ dwell in your heart by faith, rooted and grounded in love, comprehending with all saints. If this wasn't necessary, then there'd be no necessity for any exhortation. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. There'd be no necessity for any warning. Yeah. Yet the power would work in you independently of your involvement. Uh -huh. yeah. There's no need for instruction. Amen. Exhortation, admonition, rebuke, correction, none of that is needed. But the fact that it's needed tells you that for this power to work, certain conditions have to exist. And God is forward to bring these conditions to pass. Let's be clear about that, that in Christ, he's, he's not looking for a reason to condemn people. He's looking for, a re he's found a reason to save them, but they have to be aware of it. it. It's alarming to consider how many people imagine they can have benefits of God's fullness without meeting the conditions. I'm astounded at what a common thought this is. You know, they use this word unconditional. I know, I know it. And speak about these very things. I know mm -hmm. it. It's pretty clear, isn't it, here? It's, it's an expert case. I just, uh, I delight in just going over it and thinking and pondering it. It's, a, it's an expert presentation of the truth of God. Now, unto him who's able to do exceedingly above all things, we can ask you to think, according to the power of this work, work is then it's to, to him, to him. See, he's going to break forth in praise now. Just, when these things dawn on you, just pretty soon you just praise erupts like a fountain yeah, yeah. to God. <laughs> Unto him be glory. You don't have to have somebody lead you out in this either. Mm -hmm. Unto him be glory. Ah, that's the bottom line now. Yeah. Not unto us be glory. Not unto us be strength. Yeah. Unto him yeah. be glory. After all the facts are in and all the works are accomplished, this is going to be the result. He gets the glory. All of it. This includes all that was involved in us hearing the gospel, 
being drawn or coming to Christ, having our sins remitted, being justified, being prepared to be with him forever. All that is included in this unto him be glory. So when you think about your conversion, think about God doing it. There's no doubt some people associated with it, and you should give God thanks for those people, but that's after you first first, first recognize that you were drawn to Jesus by God, that he gave you the hear, that he gave you faith, that he gave you repentance, see? That he strengthened you not to faint in his presence, but to press in. Give him all the glory. Amen. Now unto him be glory in the church. Some versions say in the messianic community. That's a Jewish translation. In the assembly, Darby says. In the congregation, Tyndale said. And because of his master plan of salvation for the church. That's a living Bible. That is because, to him be glory because of what he's doing in the church. All right, now if someone was to ask you from another country, what is God doing in the church in America? Like, what would you say? It isn't that he's not doing anything, understand. It's just that it's hard to see. And it's not consistent. Different people claiming different things. Some years back, vineyard movement told the people that God is leading people to bark like dogs and hound like, howl like hounds, scream like eagles. So animal sounds. That's what God is doing. Did anybody glorify God for this? No. Scared the children. We heard one of the services going on, Sister June and I, when the kids were little, it scared them half to death. They heard it. See, so it's, this is this what God is doing is not to be interpreted by men. Yeah, right. He tells you what He's doing. He's strengthening you with might by His Spirit in the inner man. He's doing this so Christ can dwell in your heart by faith. He's doing that so you can be rooted and grounded in love. He's doing that so you can comprehend and understand what He's doing. He's doing that so he can fill you with all the fullness of God. And there's a lot of subheadings under all those things. But that's what God's doing. And it hasn't changed from the time Jesus Christ inaugurated the new covenant from the right hand of God. This has not changed. It hasn't enlarged. It hasn't become different. By Jesus, he's doing this by Jesus Christ. See, that's the reason why Jesus dwells in your heart by faith. God refuses to work apart from Christ. Amen. God will not deal directly mm -hmm. with humanity. Right. He'll deal with humanity through Christ and through the Spirit. Amen. Not directly. Why? We, it consume us. Mm -hmm. We couldn't survive an immediate confrontation of God. So it's by Christ Jesus. So, but what if Christ isn't at the center? What if Christ isn't that important? Do you really think God's going to work without Christ? He's not. Amen. By Christ Jesus. Not an occasional visit. Mm -hmm. Like Israel was visited by God. Every once in a while he'd be visited. Samson was visited at times. Became strong. But this isn't the arrangement Amen. in Christ Jesus. <coughs> By Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Now some versions this is no this is a word. The concept of eternity is not in any human language. No human language contains in it the concept of eternity. They'll say age to age. See, so it's like an extension. Gen in some versions, say generation after generation. There is no word 
for eternal or eternity it's in any resident in any language. Anytime it's in the language, language, you just read the definition of it. It's like it keeps keeps on going. It age after age, but they, they they don't have the concept of it because it's foreign. But God's an eternal God, and what He does is throughout all ages. Here's here's how some translation puts it: to all generations. I don't like that because generation means there's sometime when a new generation, from generation to generation, for all time. But that word time, gee, that's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a misfit because there's going to be any time. There isn't any time to God now. I'm showing you here that the the weakness and frailty of human language. The literal translation of it is to all the generations of a of the age of ages. So it's that's men trying to like add together a bunch of words to come up with eternity, and it just it's not possible. There there's there's a possibility that this could mean, as some people think, that he's doing it for now and for eternity. So the good, uh, the living Bible says, for all time and eternity. I, I don't personally think that's the idea. This uh, throughout all ages is an idiom for what we would call eternity. The idea is that salvation is so large and complex in its commencement, development, and consummation that the praise for it that is rendered to God cannot be assigned to a period. And the consummation, say the first 10,000 years. Well, you can't see the, the salvation is so great that it has to be opened up in the context of eternity. Amen. It can't be opened up in the context of time. You can just see the borders of it, the rough outline of it, a little aspect here, the little aspect there, but it's going to take mm -hmm. an eternity. Because even that language, take an eternity. See, they're just telling you that this is like a foreign concept to humanity. So I like he wraps up and says, world without end. He just, he just comes right out. <laughs> world without end. Most versions do put it that way. So here, as I said, it, language breaks down again, but that's how big salvation is. I mean, if you if you receive an extraordinary blessing... You, you can talk about it for a while, but pretty soon you run out of stuff to say. They just start repeating yourself. Huh? It's the way it is. Now, there was a, some, some of our families here had great deliverances during that tornado. But words failed you, didn't it? Pretty soon you, <laughs> you couldn't say anything more about it. Not because it was small, but because it was big. It was just that big you... You run out of words. Well, if that's true of temporal deliverance, just think about it. salvation, eternal salvation. Think about that. Amen. What's it, the exposition of it and the testimony of it and the praise for it will fill will fill the atmosphere of the throne for an eternity. Yeah. And this is what God has intended all along. Yeah. This is what God has intended. It begins in heaven now by him showing manifold wisdom. That's now I speak, but it, his intention is that in the end, the whole universe will know more about him. Amen. That's what this is all about. Amen. And uh, oh, what a, Amen. what a marvelous picture it is. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope you got some things from that, but that, it's hard. It's hard to to talk about like academically. You you run out. You run out of things to say. So you've just got to try and think more precisely. What did he really say? What did he What did he really do? Look at the investment God's made in your salvation. Look at Look at the investment He's made in it. What does that tell you? Some say, Well, that means that shows how valuable we are. No, that shows how great His objective is. Amen. Then after that, you come in. You'll come in after that. <laughs> yeah, but given this is a good piece of news because if you're praised uh, 
for the praise that you could give to God was limited it to now, well, it would be greatly limited because you don't, you can't even perceive the magnitude of it yet. That's right. But in the ages to come, now that's different. Yeah. Now you're going to be able to show forth what God's done in you now yeah. to a much greater degree then, and it to redound to His glory over and over. Amen. I can see that. And what we're going to be, see, yeah. what we're going to be, minus the flesh and minus the body, <laughs> It's going yes. to enhance Amen. the thing too, and it's still going to it's still going to take, still going to stretch out through yes. all the eternity. The praise, even after we've had all the handicaps removed. Yes. There's a sense that whenever this is going to continue without cessation, that <laughs> what the church is being made is whenever. Any any of the, the creatures and and hosts of heaven see the church, what they're going to be beholding is God Himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible for that. It's not going to grow old any more than knowing God mm -hmm. is going mm -hmm. to grow old. That, that there, I I don't doubt, but what there will be an increase realized. Oh we'll yes, the amen. Side. But. Uh, it's not like God did this wonderful thing and we'll talk about it and then all of a sudden it, its glory will begin to diminish like the face of Moses. It, it's not going to be on that wise mm -hmm. because God is not less glorious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the glory he gets out of the church, which is the image of his son, is not going to is not going to diminish in glory either. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a continual praise and manifestation of God Amen. Mm -hmm. without uh, without losing anything. If there's any movement at all in it, it's going to be an ascending one, not a descending uh -huh. yeah. one. Amen. Now we, we experience the kind of thing you're talking about. We experience it right now. Now we come to a fellowship and we're going to we're going to consider the love of God or or we've been in the men's fellowship for a couple of years the church. All right, when you meet you've got some pretty good ideas but then someone says something and all of a sudden your idea yeah, that's right. <laughs> gets yeah. bigger. Amen. Now think of this eternity someone prays they're glorifying God bringing praise to him and all of a sudden some new thing. Oh, yeah. You see some Fresh new perspective, so it can, it just can, it's like an explosion that keeps yeah. rippling out and out Amen. for for eternity. So there's a most of salvation. I get the idea that most of salvation, so far as what caused it, is largely hidden mm -hmm. yeah. at the present time because of human frail frailty. You know, you, you outlined this process. You know, Christ may dwell in your heart, but you be strength with the mighty dwell in your heart. This whole thing that God's been doing this has been like the ultimate process. He had to, to do all these other things, but once he has the diadem in his hand, <laughs> it's right, once it's there, now he's not going to just sit down and say, look at the diadem. He's going he's gonna to put it to use. And when that hat takes place, it's just going to create more yeah, glory. Right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anyone else tonight? Mm. Yes, Brother Ricky. I was thankful for what you said about God is able to finish mm -hmm. what he starts. Yeah. You know, often times in the scriptures this is said. Yes. He, hath, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day mm -hmm. of Christ. And Jude also said that he's able to keep you from falling and to present mm -hmm. you faultless before mm -hmm. the presence of the glory with exceeding joy. Jesus is said to be the author and finisher mm -hmm. of our faith. Amen. You know, it is the horrible tendency of flesh to believe that what bought, what God begins, they can finish. Mm. That's right. Amen. And that's what a lot of these self-help yeah. things are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God got the ball rolling and somehow they kind of got off. And so we're going to kind of get our heads together and come up with a system. And it's always a system of yeah. doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They always believe that you can be advantaged based on what you do. But it's God that gives the increase. Amen. Doing yeah. is evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Exa that's exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's kind of a way of, of, of kind of finding out where you're at. Mm -hmm. But the source of all increase is the Lord. 
And uh, I'm thankful for that because when you get into the system of doing, you invariably neglect your fellowship with the Lord. Yeah. That's just when, it, and you get full of yourself. Yeah. Either you're full of yourself because you're patting yourself on the back because you think you're making a lot of progress, or you're full of yourself because you're all disappointed that you haven't made the progress. But either the way, your focus is on you yeah. and not on the Lord. You notice that each of those things you mentioned, strengthening with might and dwelling in your heart by faith and so forth, they're all a process. It's not like a point in time where, boom, it happens. Then, then it happens again. It, it all involves a, a process, and I can see why. It, it, your perception gradually yeah. begins to grow because of this, the nature of things. You, you're able to kind of see what, what God is doing. But once you know, a lot of people, brethren, don't really know what God is doing. In salvation, they don't really know what God is doing. So if you know what God is doing, and I think most of you do, this is good to, don't assume people know this. Pass it on with a spirit of joy. Pass it on what what God is doing and plant, sow some seeds. <laughs> didn't dawn on, it didn't dawn on us all of a sudden. It's a lot, lot preceded the clarity, any clarity that we have, and and even then we find out there's things so far away we now to have our vision adjusted again. Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer.